It's that time again. Time to review some Twilight Zone. Though I unfortunately have chosen the wrong generation of it. Instead of doing the series when Rod Serling was running it, or even taking a look at a middling experience from the 80s or 2000s, I accidentally plopped in the Jordan Peele era. My bad. On the side note though, we are at least approaching the end of Season 1, so I can celebrate that little victory. Last episode was about immigration from parallel universes, so I wonder what topic this one will be about. I'll stop the filler and jump into... The Blue Scorpion. Interestingly enough, there are species of scorpions called a blue scorpion, but one that is actually blue is known as the giant blue scorpion isn't actually that lethal. The venom is just causing serious pain and numbness to the affected area. The episode opens up in this kind of neat looking room with a guy entering it while on his phone, talking to his wife about the troubles they are going through and potentially wanting to go to couples counseling or arbitration if he has to. However, he walks in on the shock of his life as he sees his father's dead body that is mostly off screen. There was also a bullet nearby with his father's name, but the name on said bullet disappears into the ether. Honestly, this part I think is really neat. It's not scary, but it's definitely a good hook. Jeff, our lead character, is asked by the police about a handgun found by his father's body with a cool blue scorpion on the handle, but does not actually belong to said father. Jeff is then given the note and sees that his father didn't even like him, apparently. E excuse me, Mr. Peel, can you please leave this poor man alone and not just sit on his dead father's furniture? Thank you. Back to the episode, a funeral is interspliced with Jeff's fall into alcoholism and depression. While rummaging through the closet, he encounters an unlocked safe with a box in it. Inside the box, Jeff finds a bullet with his own name written on it inside a pistol magazine. After finding it, he then becomes hyper-aware of every instance of the name Jeff happening around him, which goes from scary to comedic after it happens so many times. Upon returning to his wife's home, he gets held up by her while just trying to get his mail. He gets defensive, but then also learns that his wife has moved on. To another man named Jeff. Man, what is with so many Jeffs? What's the town's name? Jeffsville? Back at his home, Jeff gets intrigued by the gun, almost like a trans, before snapping out of it when he drops the magazine onto the floor like an idiot. He then rereads the note his father left as he tries to decrypt the meaning behind it before he then tries to sell the gun. While selling it, he learns that it's actually a mythical gun that wasn't even thought to exist, known as the Blue Scorpion, and it only appears to people instead of actually being found by them. It also randomly discharges, so that is one awful firearm. At Jeff's job, one of his students talks about animism to him in regards to her life and research topic. He allows her to change topics and then is met with his wife's attorney, also conveniently named Jeff. Great! The dog is named Jeff, the attorney is Jeff, the gun store guy is Bob Jeff, are the cars named Jeff too? Is it Jeffrey today? Is everyone in this town that is male just named Jeff as some sort of part of a curse around this town that was made to the pagan god Jeff? There's just so many Jeffs! Why are- we aren't even halfway into the episode, we're only- Oh, you can sod off right now! With mounting stress of the divorce lawyer and the gun store wanting to buy the legendary gun, Jeff decides to do some smoking and listen to his father's records. Oh, and he also takes the gun out from the safe so he can marvel it. But despite him putting it back in the safe, it reappears on the bed with some random man in the corner of the room trying to tempt him into using the blue scorpion, or at the very least to move it into the light as it fears the darkness. After that fun conversation, he goes down to a gun place and acts a little crazy. At the gun range, he puts the bullet with his name on it in alongside a bunch of other bullets and begins to shoot off some rounds until finding out that one bullet didn't get fired, that bullet being the one with Jeff on it. For some reason, he brings the gun then to his office, but then the scene switches over to the meeting with his wife and her lawyer while also talking rather creepily about his gun until he descends into anger as divorce settlements tend to go. In this anger, he yells about his desire to keep the Blue Scorpion, and even quotes his father's note to his wife as his obsession slowly cements itself. He even refuses to sell the gun, despite it being worth a fortune that could help him even after the divorce is finalized. He then starts to play around with it, even pointing it at some guy outside his neighbor's place, and then his own reflection. 
And then he drives down to his wife's house, like a creepy stalker. Heck, he even loads it with the one bullet, since his wife's new lover is also named Jeff conveniently. But then some guy tries to rob him. In the scuffle, Jeff manages to grab the gun and shoot the attacker dead in the street. Self-defense one, robbers zero. But wait a minute. The last time we tried to fire the Jeff bullet, it got lodged instead. Yet here, we clearly see that he was able to fire it this time. And that's when we get the little twist. This robber's first name was in fact Jeff. He is declared a hero and his life is actually getting better. He and his wife are able to come to an understanding, he gets a promotion at work, and he's able to ditch the gun. That is until two kids show up at the lake and find the blue scorpion with a bullet that has one of their names on it. And that's the end of the episode. Now, before I start, I'm going to give this episode the best praise I can give to any episode of this Forsaken season. The Blue Scorpion felt like the Twilight Zone. The politics weren't forced or annoying, in fact, there wasn't really any politics in it. It was honestly a rather solid story. The opening part of this episode was actually really well done, I'd say. Them showing the body of the dead dad wasn't needed, but the build-up to it was fantastic. The stress that Jeff has put through is also done well. You can really feel for him as small things are layered on top of each other and don't slow down. This collection of stress then leads up to a favorite moment of mine as well, where he goes to the gun range and fires the gun for the first time. It's surrounded by noise at first, until total silence when he puts the earmuffs on, which transitions us into some nice music, as this entire scenario was to put us even further into Jeff's position. The confrontation with the robber is a nice twist, I will admit, but definitely not the ending I would have gone for for what the story was actually portraying. It also doesn't help that before we know the man was named Jeff, we were barraged with that name, just being everywhere. I wouldn't say it's a bad move, but not one I would have gone down if I were writing it, as I just started to laugh at the absurdity of the number of Jeffs in this one town. Plus, it would have been more shocking if the robber being named Jeff was either the only or maybe one more instance of the name instead of, like, the 20th. If I were to rewrite this, I would cut down on the time with the wife and divorce stuff even more, and instead write them as never-ending phone calls that come almost every day. In the meeting with his student, the lawyer would call. When he's alone in the home and trying to relax, the lawyer would call. The calls could even push him to go to the gun range, as either the sound of the bullets would drown it out, or the earmuffs would deafen it while him shooting could finally bring him some peace. Another rewrite I would do is to change the ending entirely, and instead make Jeff sadly succumb to the cries of the gun and off himself. Then, some other person finds it as some sort of eternal curse that travels from person to person, like the episode was setting up with the line of, The Gun Finds You. Two kids randomly happening upon it while Jeff is able to escape its influence is... kinda lame. However, all these actors are actually really good. They did a phenomenal job and should be recognized for it. As said, this episode was just really solid and felt like a Twilight Zone episode, or even just a decent horror episode, which is so much better than almost every other episode so far. The only exception being the Wunderkind, because that one had at least one likable scene to it. Also, I just want to say, the blue scorpion looks absolutely cool. I don't care that it's afraid of the dark and that the fear of the dark is never really important story-wise, it just looks awesome, and I would definitely pay $100,000 for it. This episode, for being an actually good episode I do actually want to rewatch for fun instead of work, scores an 8 out of 10. Not perfect, but it is a step in the right direction for the series. Just a shame it came so late into the season. This way. I know which way it is. Just, just slow down. No way. I'm far too excited for this. This crater, it, it's way too big. I wonder how much is left from the impact. 
take this seriously. Hey, look, the smoke is clearing. Time to see what dropped. Huh? There's no way. A wolf? What the heck is going on here? 